Hello and welcome to another Control Systems tutorial with me, Richard Pates. The topic of today's lecture will be state observers. A state observer is a system that's designed to continuously estimate the current value of the state of a state space model of a system based only on the measurements that have been taken about that system. We will introduce a very simple method of state observer design based on exactly the same pole placement technique that was used to design state feedback controllers in a previous lecture. But what is it that we would like to achieve? Well, suppose we have a state space model of a system x dot is equal to ax plus bu and y is equal to cx. The purpose of the state observer is to come up with an estimate of the value of the state x at every point in time t. We denote this estimate as x hat of t. However, when coming up with this estimate, we cannot directly measure the value of the state x. We only have access to our measured output y. The difficulty here is that the matrix C may not be invertible. That is, we cannot simply invert the matrix C and put it over here. If this was possible, we would be able to calculate the value of x at every point in time t just by passing y of t through this uh, transformation. However, working in our favor, we do have a wide range of measurements y. That is, at the given point in time t, we don't just have access to the measurement of y that we take at the time t. We also have access to the whole series of measurements uh, from previous times. So what would we like to happen? Well, to sort of sketch this, uh, let's consider the picture on the right, which illustrates the state space of the system. I suppose at some point in time, the true value of the system state was given by x of t here, so at this point in the state space. And then we apply some external inputs and the dynamics of the system causes uh, this um, us to move through the state space along some trajectory, say, like so. Our objective is to come up with some system that only uses measurements y and also has some knowledge of the matrices A, B, and C, so that by continually updating our estimate of x hat, we have the property that as x hat moves through the state space, it gets closer and closer to the true value of the state x of t. So it might follow a trajectory something like that. Fortunately, there's a very simple way to design a system to give accurate estimates of the state of a state space model. Uh, to explain this system, let's first uh, start by just writing out the equations for the state space model itself. So that's x dot is equal to ax plus bu with x at time t is equal to zero equal to something that we don't know what it is. So we'll just put a question mark for now. And then y is equal to cx. And now the system that can give accurate um, estimates of the state is given by these two equations here and the variable x hat that's just our state estimate variable so what do these two equations tell us well let's start with the first one and this one is telling us that uh, we should make the rate of change of our state estimate so that's x hat dot equal to ax hat plus bu so that's directly mirroring the first equation in the actual state space model. And then plus some funny term. And then here we have the initial um, condition for x hat set so that um, x hat at time t is equal to zero is equal to the zero vector. This is kind of an arbitrary choice that just reflects that we don't know what the true value of the state is at time t is equal to zero. If we had a, a better estimate, say, we could put that in in place of the zero uh, vector here. And the second equation, well, that's just saying that y hat, so this is like our estimate of the output is equal to c times x hat. So it's the estimate of the output if our, uh, based on our estimate of the state. And so what about this 
funny extra term here? Well, it contains a few things. Uh, the first of which is this matrix L. And actually, this is the thing that we want to design. So when we're asked to design a state observer, what we're often being asked to do is uh, choose this matrix L here. And then we've got two other things. Well, we have the difference between our estimate of the output and the uh, measured output y. So this is this whole term here, this is acting like a kind of error. Uh, the smaller this is, uh, the closer and closer our state estimate will be getting to uh, the true value of the state. And we can see that if x hat and x match exactly, then this sort of error term will be equal to zero. And the a design objective is to pick L so that this term here will decay quickly. Um, in order to do analysis and work out how to design uh, the matrix L, it's helpful to put this model into state space form. It's not actually in state space form yet, and the reason for that is because the first equation actually depends on the second one. Um, but we can easily fix that just by substituting the second equation into the first and get something in the more conventional state space form. So let's do that. Well, then the first equation becomes x hat dot is equal to a and then plus l times c times x hat. So plus l c. And that's all multiplied by x hat. And this is the kind of A matrix in uh, the state space description of the state observer. And then what do we have? Well, we have uh, plus BU. And then we also have minus LY. So we actually have two inputs to our state space model, which is something we've not encountered yet, but it's. Uh, it's no major change. It's just like having more than just you as an input. Um, this time we also have the measured output from the system um, available to us. And the second equation is just exactly the same as it was before. Y hat is equal to C X hat. So this is our state space model for the state observer. And here it is written in um, equivalent transfer function form. So here we've just taken Laplace transforms of everything here. And yeah, I've been a bit lazy here, really. There should be these U's and Y's. These should also depend. So these are signals themselves. So it'd be better practice to put their dependence on S in here as well. So what are we trying to achieve um, with our design of the matrix L? Um, we won't actually explain why this works yet. We'll um, explain that towards the end of the lecture. Here, we'll just say what you need to do. Well, looking at this equation here, we see sort of uncanny similarities um, with the state feedback setup that we saw before. In the state feedback uh, problem, we were always dealing with uh, the matrix A plus BK. And here we've got something very similar going on, but um, with A plus LC. And actually, we're going to uh, conduct design of L, just as we were conducting design of K in the state feedback case. So we're going to cover the pole placement method for designing the matrix L. And um, just, in, just as in the state feedback case, this will mean pick the matrix L so that the eigenvalues of A plus LC, or equivalently the poles in the transfer function description, uh, lie in particular configurations um, in the left half plane. And just with state feedback, there are no hard and fast ways to go about doing this. Um, the only condition that we'll need uh, for x hat to converge to the true value of the state x is that the poles lie in the left half plane. However, a reasonable rule of thumb is that we should pick the, the poles to be further into the left half plane than the time scales on which we're expecting the dynamics of our system to evolve. That is, we want to make our observer faster than the system itself. We want to 
basically we want our state estimate to converge fast enough so that we can use it to implement a state feedback controller based on x hat instead or something like that but these are all details for another lecture so how do we go about doing this well as we said before things are all very similar to designing um uh, state feedback controllers however this time we want to choose the matrix l to place the poles of the state observer in particular configurations or so let's just write out the state space model for the state observer again so we saw that x hat dot was equal to a plus l c um, times x hat and then plus b u minus l y and then well y hat is equal to c x hat and our objective is to pick the matrix l to place the eigenvalues of uh, this matrix in desired configurations so what's the first thing that we observe well the eigenvalues of this matrix are given by the solutions to uh, this equation here this uh, determinant equation here and what will this be well just as with state feedback this is just going to be some big polynomial of the form a naught s to the power of n and this small n here this comes from the dimensions of the matrix a so the matrix here a is n by n uh, plus a1 times s to the n minus 1 plus so on all the way up to a n and these coefficients a0 through a n they'll depend on the entries in the matrix A, the entries in the matrix C, and also the entries in the matrix L, which we're free to choose. So this is uh, the equation that will give us uh, the eigenvalues of the matrix A plus LC. So sorry. Um, so the roots S to this equation will give us the eigenvalues. And in order to go about doing this, we need the same key insight that we had from the state feedback case, uh, which was that the zeros of two polynomials are the same if they have the same coefficients. So just as before, the way we're going to go about doing this is we're going to write out the polynomial which has zeros in the locations that we desire, and then go about um, picking the bits in A0 through AN that depend on our matrix L um, so that these coefficients match those in the coefficients of the desired polynomial. And we'll just do an example to illustrate this. So what do we have to do? Suppose that uh, P of S is given by this transfer fun function here with A, B, and C matrices as follows. A design a state observer with poles in the Butterworth configuration with omega c is equal to the square root of 2. Okay, let's just do this first. Um, so what do we have to do? Well, we have to pick our matrix L such that the um, determinant of Si minus A minus LC matches, uh, well, has poles in the Butterworth configuration, and therefore by our second insight, we require this uh, to match the uh, corresponding Butterworth polynomial. Now, this is a second-order system, so we have to use the second-order Butterworth polynomial. And if I remember correctly, that the Butterworth polynomial was given by this equation here which if we substitute in this particular value of omega c gives us s squared plus 2s plus 2. So our objective is to pick the matrix L such that this equation is satisfied. And if we do, then we will end up with a state observer with poles in the locations of the zeros of the Butterworth polynomial or in the Butterworth uh, configuration. So the first thing we have to do is build this matrix, then take the determinant of it, and then match uh, coefficients. So let's build the matrix. So what do we have? We have S, I. So that's this matrix here. 
and from that we subtract a so we subtract one three four two and then we subtract l and so what are the dimensions of l going to be well c is one by two so l needs to be two by one so we'll put in two parameters l1 and l2 and this is multiplied by c which is one naught and now we need to just slot in um, to simplify this into one big matrix so what goes in the one one entry well that's s minus one minus l1 so s minus one minus l1 in the one two entry naught minus three and that's it that's nice in this entry where well, we have minus four minus l2 minus four minus l2 and finally we get s minus two and okay so we found this matrix here now we need to take the determinants so what kind of algebraic nightmare did richard of the past give us let's find out okay it doesn't look too bad so taking the determinant so first we multiply the one one and the two two entries so that's s minus two multiplied by s minus one minus l one and then we subtract and uh, we've got a whole load of minuses here so this multiplied by this and let's cancel the minuses as well so that's minus three multiplied by four plus l2 okay and now we need to multiply this out and collect powers of s so what happens if we multiply out this first expression well we get an s squared let's try and be a bit sneaky and collect all of the powers of s in one go so this s is going to give us a minus one and a minus l1 and this s is going to give us a minus two so we'll be left with minus three minus l1 and then we get a constant term of minus also uh, we get a constant term of two plus two l one and then from this we subtract 12 and three times l2 okay so this polynomial here this is our determinant polynomial and now we just need to pick the entries of the matrix l so that this polynomial matches this polynomial and we do this one coefficient at a time well the s squared terms match so that's good news and now we need to match the s terms so we need uh, minus 3 minus l1 to equal 2 and that implies that l1 is equal to minus 5 yes that's right and now to match the second term we need this thing here to be equal to 2 so we need okay so we've got 2 and a minus 12 so we need minus 10 and then we need plus 2 times l1 okay that's nice um, and then minus 3 l2 we need that to equal 2. So what do we have? Well, we found that L1 is equal to minus 5, so we've got minus 20. So we pull that over. No, no, we leave minus 20 here. We pull this 2 over, so we've got minus 22 on the left-hand side, and then 3L2 on the right-hand side. So simplifying this, we get that L2 is equal to minus 22 over 3 and uh, that's the answer to the first part if we pick the state feedback matrix L with entries minus 5 
and minus 22 over 3, we will end up with a state uh, observer which has poles in the Butterworth configuration with omega c is equal to the square root of 2. Now on to the second part. What other pole locations are possible? Justify your answer. Well, this looks uncannily familiar to a question that we had in the state feedback um, video, but we'll do it again. Why not? Um, but we'll have to clear everything here. So let's just wipe away all the text. Right. So where can we place the poles? Well, we just found uh, that the determinant polynomial was equal to s squared plus, and then what did we have? Minus 3 minus L1 multiplied by s, and then we had plus 2L1 minus 3L2 minus 10. And we know that the zeros of this polynomial, so the values of s such that this polynomial is equal to 0, give us the roots um, it will give us the poles of our state observer. So the question is, really, by picking different values of L1 and L2, where can we push the zeros of this um, quadratic equation? And now we see that by picking L1, we can make this first co coefficient equal to whatever we want. So we could equivalently call this first coefficient B, because we're able to pick L1 to make this equal to whatever we want, so we can make it equal to B for whatever B we wanted. And similarly here, for any choice of L1, we can pick L2 to make this uh, constant coefficient equal to whatever we want. Um, so we could make this equal to, let's say, gamma minus B squared over 4 if we wanted to, and the motivation for this will become clear in a second. So picking L1 and L2 is equivalent to picking B and, and gamma. That's the, the only point of this variable change here. And now this is a quadratic equation, so we can find its um, zeros using the quadratic formula. And in particular, the solutions here will be given by um, S is equal to, and then we have minus this thing, so minus b, that's why we called it b, and then plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times this coefficient, which is 1, and this one, which we've rather conveniently chosen to be gamma minus b squared over 4, all over 2. So these are the zeros of this polynomial. And so by picking different values of b and gamma, um, the question is what locations are possible. And so this simplifies a little bit. Um, and we get minus b plus or minus um, the square root. And the, these b to squared terms cancel out. And we're left with uh, minus 4. So, well, we can pull the 2 out here and have minus square root of gamma all over 2. And so, really, yeah, so, so now we just need to work out where in the complex plane, by picking different values of b and gamma, we can place the zeros. And now we can very quickly see that we can place them absolutely wherever we want, as long as they come in complex conjugate pairs. So, Let's just draw a sketch of the complex plane like that. And so if uh, gamma is positive, then we get a pair of zeros at the coordinate minus b. So I don't know, minus b and then oh, over 2, b over 2, and then plus or minus, and then because gamma will be positive, we'll get some complex um, distance here. So the zero location might, will be here. And this distance here will be given by um, the square root of the absolute value of gamma. And we'll get another one down here. So, and by picking different values of b, we can achieve 
any uh, and, and different values of gamma we can achieve any complex conjugate pair absolutely anywhere in the complex plane and similarly if gamma is negative then we get all real solutions and it's easy enough to see that we can actually get any pair of real zeros so no matter where we want our zeros to be on the real line we can always find a value of b and a value of gamma such that that will be um, achieved so what other pole locations are possible well any pair of um, complex conjugate uh, poles are possible and any pair of real poles are also possible and just as with state feedback this is um connected to the concept of observability and in fact this is a general fact as long as the original system was observable we're able to place the poles wherever we like and this holds not just for dimension two but um higher dimensions as well so we can place them wherever we like under the conjugate uh, complex conjugate uh, restriction um so that would be another justification uh, we could alternatively um compute the observability matrix, check that the system was observable, and then we could say, ah, we can place the poles wherever we like. So, so now we know what a state observer is, and we know how to design one using a pole placement method. All that remains really is to work out why on earth this uh, strange looking system will work and give us accurate estimates of the true value of the state. And to understand this, let's start just by writing out the equations for both the um, state space model and the state space description of the state observer. So for the model, we get x dot is equal to ax plus b u, and then some unknown initial condition, and y is equal to cx. So that's our state space model. And here is the state space model of our state observer. That's x hat dot is equal to a plus lc, all multiplied by x hat. And then we've got our plus bu minus ly. And similarly, uh, y hat is equal to c x hat. And well, for completeness, we had some initial condition that we just said was going to be equal to zero through lack of any better alternatives. Now, the objective of the state observer is, uh, well, we would love x hat to tend to x. We would like our state estimate to get closer and closer to the um, true value of the state. So how can we measure this? Well, we could introduce a variable e that was equal to x minus x hat. So e is just giving us the difference between um, the actual value of the state and our estimate of the state at every single point in time. And now we can also ask the question, um, we know what differential equations x and x hat will follow. They're given here. What's the differential equation that e is going to follow? Well, just differentiating this expression, we get that e dot is equal to um, x dot minus x hat dot. And of course, e of zero is just going to be equal to, well, question mark as well. Um, so e of zero is equal to x of zero minus x hat of zero. And in our slightly dodgy notation, that's just question mark. And um, now we can substitute in for x dot and x hat dot. So what do we get? Well, we get that e dot is equal to a x plus b u, and then minus, well, a plus l c x hat minus b u plus l y. And now let's start to simplify things a little bit. Well, the first thing that we can do to simplify things is these BU terms. They're just going to cancel out. And also, we've got a rather irritating Y here. But we can elim eliminate that just by substituting in Y is equal to CX. And so if we do that, what do we get? Well, we find that A plus LC 
x. So this LC has come from this plus LY over here, minus A plus LC x hat. And actually, this simplifies further. And we find that we get A plus LC x minus x hat, but x minus x hat is just e. So we find that e follows the differential equation. e dot is equal to a plus lc multiplied by e. And now all is revealed, provided the eigenvalues of a plus i in the left half plane, we're guaranteed that e of t is going to tend to zero, because this will be describing a stable system. However, the eigenvalues of A plus LC, these are nothing but uh, the poles of our state observer. So this is exactly what we've been placing um, in the previous example. And so this is why we want to use our matrix L to place the poles of the state observer to lie in the left half plane. And depending on where we place them, we can get E of T to converge to zero faster or yeah, more quickly or more slowly. In conclusion, today we learned about the simple state observer described by the following system of equations. This state observer could be used to construct an estimate of the true value of the state x of t of a state space model based only on the measured output y of t. The state estimate was given by this variable x hat of t. The state observer consists of two parts. The first part is just mirroring the dynamics of the state space model itself, and the second a kind of error term. The design of the state observer corresponded to choosing this matrix L, and provided it was chosen in an appropriate way, we could guarantee that this error term would converge to zero, and the state estimate x hat would converge to the true value of the state. When written in state space form, the state observer was given by x hat dot is equal to a plus lc times x hat plus bu minus ly and then y hat is equal to c x hat. Provided that the system, uh, the well, the true state space model is observable, the poles of the state observer are given by the zeros of this determinant, and they can be freely placed wherever we like in the complex plane, provided all complex poles come with a conjugate pair. We then saw that if the state observer is stable, then the state estimate will converge to the true value of the state. That is, x of t minus x hat of t will tend to zero. And that's it for today. Thank you for sticking with it this far. Next time, we'll con uh, combine this state observer design method with the state feedback design method that we uh, learned about in an earlier lecture.